Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Gordon Pennycook. He is Assistant Professor of Behavioral Science at the University of Regina Hill Levine Schools of Business. He is also an Associate Member of the Department of Psychology there. He is a member of the Editorial Board for Thinking and Reasoning and a Consulting Editor for Judgment and Decision Making. His research focus is on reason and decision-making broadly defined. He investigates the distinction between intuitive processes and more deliberative reasoning processes and is principally interested in the causes and consequences of analytic thinking. Dr. Penny Cook has published on religious belief, sleep paralysis, morality, creativity, smartphone use, health beliefs, for example, homeopathy, uh, language use among climate change deniers, pseudo profound BS, delusional ideation, fake news, political ideology and science beliefs. is also interested in the methodological and theoretical issues that pertain to the measurement of cognitive reflection and motivated reasoning and that's a lot of topics but we're going to cover some of them today. So Dr. Penny Cook, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. It's my pleasure to be on. Thanks. Okay, great. So uh, let's start with one of the things that I mentioned in the introduction. The differences between intuitive processes, that is that kind of gut feeling processes that we have, and the more deliberative reasoning processes. So what are some of the main differences between the two? Yeah, so uh, there's actually kind of a long and I would say maybe boring a little bit debate about this uh, in the field. Um, so the, the, um, the basic kind of theoretical basis is it's called dual process theories and there's like every single person who publishes on dual process theory has their own specific version of it. Um, what, what I tend to use to distinguish intuitive and reflective processes is simply is one thing which is just uh, autonomous processing like uh, when something, some sort of stimulus is encountered in the environment, um, sometimes something just pops into your head, right? Two plus two equals, you don't have to do math to get four out of that. Um, but if I say, you know, what's 38 times 72, you have to actually basically kind of decide to solve the problem, right? You have to stop and you have to think and reflect. And those to me seem like fundamentally different sorts of things. Um, and that's the, that's the kind of basis of the distinction between intuition and reflection. Intuition are those things that pop into our head, things that we retrieve from long-term memory or um, uh, simple perceptions that we have or, uh, or whatever, feelings that we have. Um, um, and our reflective reasoning is the stuff that kind of happens later. It's more discretionary. It's, it's something that we need to do sometimes to, to correct faulty intuitions. But often sometimes what we do is just spend time thinking about why we're right um, so it doesn't always... Uh, Correct, but sometimes it makes things more erroneous. But that's that's the basic distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned that there's a debate going around, I guess, that in this case it would be in cognitive psychology, right, about dual process theory or dual systems theory. So what is the debate really about there? Are, are there people that don't think there are two, di two distinct processes occurring in our minds or what exactly? Yeah, there's, there's, there's kind of separate sets of debates. One debate is that, that people don't think that there's a kind of fundamental difference between two, the, the two different types of processes, that it's just a kind of continuum from relatively intuitive to relatively, like, deliberative. Um, ultimately, that, that is, I think, and Wim Denays has a, a recent paper on this, it's kind of a purely academic and probably not that important debate. Like, whether, whether or not it's the fundamental difference between two different types or not. We can still say with you know strong confidence that there's a distinction between two plus two equals four and 20, 38 times seventy two. That is like whether it's a continuum or uh, you know, a hard break is um, maybe interesting for like deep cognitive theory, but doesn't really have that much practical relevance or doesn't really have much impact for most of the stuff that we investigate. Um, other aspects of the debate have less to do with cognitive psychology and more to do with the way that dual process theories are used kind of more broadly, uh, and that is as a kind of collection of characteristics, right? People, you'll say, um, 
our intuitions tend to be faster um, or they tend to be unconscious or they tend to be like unintentional or whatever. Um, and if you add up all these characteristics, what you end up with is like a bunch of things that couldn't possibly all be true at the same time. Uh, uh, Melnikoff and Barge had a paper in this in uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences. Um, the issue I had with their paper, of course, is that they say, therefore, their you know dual process theory is not something that makes any sense. But that, you know, but they are themselves, of course, making distinctions between, for example, conscious and unconscious processing, which is itself a dual process theory. So, the so ultimately, all the debates are a little bit academic, and uh, um, generally speaking, people will acknowledge that we have intuitions and we can stop and reflect, and that's really what I'm most interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the conscious, less unconscious bit of things, or, or the, that bit of the debate, perhaps there are people that think, or their opinion is that, uh, let's say that the deliberative reasoning processes are the conscious side of things. Perhaps there are people that think that consciousness doesn't play that uh, important of a causal role in the process and uh, most of what occurs in our minds and even the outputs that we get in terms of behavior are mostly or completely uh, determined at the subconscious level. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and not just that, but um, for example, if you are associating kind of the intuitive type one system one processes with speed and being unconscious, and then you know the conscious deliberate processes being slow, you know then you have to grapple with the fact that sometimes things that are conscious are fast, right? Uh, yeah. And sometimes things that are unconscious are slow, right? So once you, if you have, if you say these are the characteristics, the like crystal. Uh, uh, intractable characteristics of these two different types of systems, then it, the theory immediately falls apart because the characteristics are separate things, right? Especially speed is not really, it's not a cognitive process. So um, that is the kind of, that's the the nature of the debate. But there's, you know, within all of those, all the elements that people talk about that tend to be subsumed under this large dual process theory umbrella, you know, there could be whole literatures based on just one element of it, uh, and so one issue with the literature is that it's too broad. You know, it's it's good it's good in the sense that, like for my own research, um, I've kind of applied the general idea to lots of different domains, like you had listed creativity and uh, smartphone use, whatever. Um, but then there's some issues when it comes to if you if your theory is so broad that it can accommodate everything, then it's uh, sometimes hard to be specific, and so you need to have specific uh, instantiations of the kind of theory applied to specific kind of phenomena and so that that is not easy to write large uh, think pieces on <laughs> in like trans cognitive sciences or perspectives and so that tends to be ignored a bit more than the the grand the grand theories at least mm -hmm. and uh, foc focusing still on this debate does uh, do we have any evidence as if analytic thinking lead us to better judgments because there are those pers those those people and i mean People in general, I guess, sometimes uh, say that their intuitions are better than the kinds of decisions that they make after they, after they have reflected a little bit on the kinds of decisions that they have to make. There are people that say that they are very intuitive people, and so they prefer following their intuitions, that they get better results with that. So does analytic thinking really lead us always to better judgments, or is it better for for us at least now and then to follow our gut feelings? Uh, it definitely does not always lead to better decisions, that's for sure. I mean, it depends entirely on the context that you're talking about. Then there was a, there was a classic debate uh, between uh, Kahneman and uh, Klein, and they had a paper, a joint paper together where they came to an agreement, which is basically like, so if you, if you do research on expertise, one thing that you're going to find a lot of the time is that people's intuitions are really their best tools that they can use. Firefighters have to make rapid choices. The more expertise they have, the more trained they are, the better the choices will be. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, stopping and thinking isn't important for those sorts of judgments. So presumably when the firefighters were under training, they had to think about the instructions and that's how things become automatic for them is through practice and reflection. Um, when it comes to uh, issues that I tend to focus on more, uh, we have often faulty intuitions. We, you know, a problem leads us astray, or it feels like um, 
kind of intuitively unappealing to vaccinate your kid, for example, right? Um, and these are the cases where reflection is important, where we have to stop and think and try to overcome our kind of emotional impulses and, and intuitions. And so, and so I guess the answer to the question is it depends on uh, what the context is and who you're talking about. Generally speaking, the people who one, one kind of broad issue is that if you have a strong amount of confidence in your intuitions, um, that may be justified in certain contexts if you're if you're a firefighter and you're operating within the realm of your expertise. Um, but what you can't do is verify whether your intuitions are correct by using your intuition. You have to reflect on whether you're doing the right thing or being accurate. And so you still need reflection even if you are in the realm of expertise to make sure you're doing the right sort of thing and to step back every once in a while. And so I would be cautious of those who claim to have all omnipresent intuitions as they almost certainly do not. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, there are many pieces of information, for example, so, uh, from the social domain that we tend to process mostly at the subconscious level and still, even though it's not probably uh, explicit or uh, it doesn't occur at a conscious or at a verbal level, that, that, that is, we aren't really able to articulate that kind of knowledge we tend to gather knowledge, for example, from other people and have intuitions about them that I, I'm not sure if most of the time, but at least a lot of the time they are correct. Right. Right. Yeah, I think there, so the extent to which your intuition is going to be helpful depends on whether the things that you've gathered from the world match the context or the situation that you happen to find yourself in. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we're really good at recognizing faces. Right. Uh, and things of that nature. You don't have to you don't have to stop and think about that. And it's good that you don't, obviously. Um, uh, but then, you know, there are plenty of cases where we, you know, we live in a pretty complex world. And if we just went with our gut when we're like on Facebook and deciding what we should share, or maybe that would be a bad idea. We probably should st stop and verify uh make sure that things are accurate before we share them, for example. Uh, and that takes, that you have to stop and think. You can't just rely on your intuition for that. Your intuition might be okay. Like if you have a lot of political knowledge, for example, um, you can probably, you'll be, most people are probably, are actually pretty good at recognizing when things are false. But, you know, that's still not as good as actually checking and verifying. Uh, and so, you know, again, it depends on the context and how important the judgment is and all that kind of stuff. And so... Yeah, uh, later on in the interview, we're going to get into misinformation and the spread of misinformation on social media specifically. But before we get there, uh, another cognitive mechanism that people talk about has to do with, I mean, sometimes it's called reason, other times it's called rationality or reasoning. I mean, there are several different words and there are also several different definitions. And I guess that's a problem because... Uh, I mean, sometimes when people refer to reason, they are talking about a supposed cognitive mechanism that we have that if we were to put it into practice, we would be able to, uh, to uh, get at objective truth. I mean, at something that is out there about the world that would be objective. And other times people are simply referring to a mechanism that allows for us to, for example, uh, come up with arguments to defend our position, like uh, like happens, for example, in uh, Sperber's and Mercier's uh, uh, argumentative theory of reasoning. So, uh, at least in your work, and I don't know if you want to talk about cognitive psychology in general, when people refer to reason or reasoning or rationality, what are they talking about exactly? Yes, I mean, so the field of reasoning is not, they they would, the, those, my colleagues and other people in the field would pretty strongly reject the kind of link between reasoning and rationality per se. Like that is, it might be that reasoning helps support rationality. And, and, and for example, Keith Stanovich um, has written a lot about um, the importance of, uh, and the, the kind of unique aspect of being a human. He has a great book with, but I don't think I'm not sure that many people have read it, uh, unfortunately. But it's one of my favorite books. It's called The Robots Rebellion. Um, and so in the book, he kind of takes a meme-eyed uh, view of uh, evolution, basically. But his argument is that um, the thing that makes kind of humans unique is that we can kind of overcome our evolutionary impulses. You know, we can we can uh, uh, make choices that are counter to 
are genes that you know are good for the the uh, um, you know you as an individual, not just passing along your genes or whatever. Um, and so uh, there there's some kind of link between. You can see why people make the inference that rationality and reasoning are together. But as from the cognitive psychological perspective, when we say reasoning, we just mean the kind of cognitive processes of like thinking through problems and uh and so reasoning uh doesn't actually even necessarily only mean like deliberate reflection and analytic thinking Re you know a lot a big aspect of reasoning is having you know intuitions that that uh, inform the choices that you make in fact you probably would not be able to reason if you didn't have intuition right that that is the the thing that you reason about are the things that pop into your head right so you yeah. need you need intuition to scaffold up off of, uh, so that you can you can change your mind and and uh, and you know maybe improve your answers, but maybe make them worse. And so it depends on the context for that as well. And other things like how much cognitive ability do you have, and how much you know how much have you practiced reasoning and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's yeah. So that's that's the distinction between between those things. Uh, the distinction between reasoning and rationality, and in that case, rationality would be. That thing that people talk about that would lead us to objective truth or something like that. Yeah, the, I mean, the, there's quite a there's kind of a large philosophical literature on what it means to be rational. Like you can think about um, the distinction between instrumental rationality and epistemic rationality. Mm -hmm. Instrumental. So basically, it's about whether the person is doing something inappropriate. So instrumental rationality is like, am I behaving in a way? that you know helps me get along in the world basically in a simple sort of way you know animals are have instrumental rationality you know they forage for food and all kind of stuff epistemic rationality is having beliefs that accord with kind of evidence it's a more tricky thing because you have to determine what that is and, and so on um that's the kind of rationality that i tend to focus on in my own work but um basically the you know so when people want to distinguish between reasoning and rationality what they want to say is that accuracy and reasoning are different things that you can reason and be inaccurate and make bad choices and have irrational beliefs and so on. Um, so they're they're different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and since you also linked uh, intuitions to reasoning, is it the case that smarter people, that is, for example, people with higher I IQs, have better intuitions? Do we know anything about that? We do. In fact, uh, a paper with my um, honor supervisor, Valerie Thompson, uh, I think it's 2018, maybe 2019 in JP General, um, was about specifically smart people having smarter intuitions. In fact, a lot of the the reasoning literature, when we give people like word problems, like a, a belief bias syllogism or um, you know the cognitive reflection test or whatever, the bat and ball problem, all these things, a lot of the a lot of the Variance in performance, the 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 um, area where people who are smarter do better actually comes out kind of immediately. Like they don't have to stop and reflect on the problems to do better on them. In other words, uh, so it's not that people who are smarter, for example, when they're taking like a IQ tests, are spending that much more on the on the on the test. Although they probably do, they're more motivated to do it and all that kind of stuff. But they just know more about things, and they uh, their processing is faster. Also. Um, and so they can apply their uh, their knowledge of the world in the more appropriate way. And so that basically comes out as be having smarter intuitions in mm -hmm. most contexts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this context, intuitions, they might, uh, might also refer to, I mean, let's say that we learn something new uh, with time and as we memorize it or and as it becomes an automatized behavior, for example, that's also that also falls under the rubric of intuitions, that is, the we being able to automatically and unconsciously process information. That, that's also the kind of thing that you are referring to, correct? Yeah, that's right. And intuition is defined by us as like the way that things are processed at that moment, right? And so a good example of this is uh, master chess players, right? They can automatically identify like thousands of configurations on the board without having to think about it, right? But of course, to get there, they had to think very deeply about chess for many years and, you know, and memorize things and so on. So reflection uh, helps intuition, but intuition helps reflection. So these things are not, they, you know, they, they work together. You need, you need both if you're going to have high accuracy. If you, if you don't stop and think about things, you're going to have worse intuitions. Um, if you ignore your intuitions, you'll have worse 
uh, responses because, you know, insofar as your intuitions are tied to, uh, uh, you know, to reality and so on, obviously. But, yeah. yeah. And just to close the topic of reasoning, what is motivated reasoning about? Oh, God, that's a, that's a hard one because <laughs> motivated reasoning is one of these terms that's used so frequently uh, and is never really defined. Uh, and so I like, um, so people, what, what happens a lot in social psychology in particular is that you look, you find group differences. So like liberals and conservatives differ on some sort of thing. Um, and then it is inferred that this means that they're engaging in motivated reasoning, right? Like, for example, I could give, I could give you um, a statement uh, that says like, you should wear masks during the pandemic. And I, I could put on the thing, it's like, this was a Democrat that said it, or this is Republican, and people will treat it differently depending on their allegiance to the party. People think that this is uh, evidence of motivated reasoning, um, but that's not necessarily the case. It could be just that people have probably fairly logical, they make par fairly logical inferences about who they should trust based on their kind of allegiances, who they're around. So people who are Democrats trust Democrats more, people who are Republicans trust Republicans more. And so when they see the statement, they're going to have an automatic kind of more positive evaluation of that statement, basically kind of regardless of what it is. And that's, there's nothing about that that's reasoning, not in the sense that it's reasoning with the uh, implying that it's kind of an uh, act of deliberation. Um, it's a kind of automatic, it's more like motivated intuitions, you know what I mean, or intuitions that relate to people's motivations, another, another way to put it. Um, you know, and so they, you know, I don't see where, where that part is, what part of that is motivated. Um, one of the theories about motivated reasoning that is more clear on what it actually is, is Dan Kahan's uh, identity protective cognition is what he calls it, where people, he, you know, argues that they're engaging to, in system two reasoning, that in a motivated way, that, for example, if you look at climate change, people who are more um, numerate, more reflective, more intelligent, essentially, tend to be more polarized, in the United States at least, around the topic of climate change. That is, Democrats who are smarter are more likely to think that's a problem, whereas Republicans who are smarter are less likely to think that's a problem. Or at least this is what the data said back in 2012. And so he takes that as evidence that what reasoning is doing in that, in that politically charged context is not bringing people towards the truth or any you know, sort of evidence it's just being used to reinforce their kind of political allegiances, you know, protect their political identities and all that kind of stuff. Um, we may talk about this more at the misinformation, uh, when we talk about misinformation, but we, uh, the re most recent research that I've been doing on this finds just very little evidence for that, that in most cases, people who are better at reasoning are just more likely to kind of agree with science or have more kind of more accurate responses. And uh, political polarization isn't as big as people thought. So, like this this idea that people engage in motivated reasoning, motivated system two reasoning, doesn't seem to hold that much water. And so, when you ask me what is motivated reasoning, I don't really know what it is. I know what people talk about, but I'm not sure what the psychological process is, whether it exists, and how to how to assess it, basically. Okay, so probably this is one of social psychologists. Social, social psychology's phenomenon that has to be reviewed in some way because uh, I mean mo since since you said that it probably would be better to call it motivated uh, instead of reasoning uh, intuitioning or intuitionism or something like that because this has more to do with intuitions or some intuitive process than with reasoning right yeah, it's possible. I mean, you might want to call it motivated unreasoning. Like, I think in some cases, people, when they face something that is really kind of um, counter to what they want to believe or, like, um, aversive, they probably just avoid it. Like, they're not going to spend a lot of time explaining to themselves why it's okay and why it's wrong. They probably just will ignore it. And so I think that probably happens where people d decide not to think about something uh, that's aversive. And so there's there's probably different elements that basically... Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the things that we that are called motivated reasoning are probably lots of different things, uh, and you know, and the term motivated reasoning doesn't really explain what they are very well, um, and so there definitely needs to be something, uh, and you know, I was I've been thinking about getting on that, but I'm <laughs> don't hold your breath. Uh, we'll see what happens, but um, there there needs to be some sort of systematic review of of uh, how we use that term because it I don't think it means what people think it think it does.
<laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there has been a big replication crisis in psychology and even more so in some of its branches like social psychology and there are many phenomena that are being many phenomena that are being reevaluated or at least new literature points in different directions so and uh, i would like to ask you uh, did the dunning kruger effect and when we you start your answer please try to g give us a definition of the dunning kruger effect did the dunning kruger effect replicate or not so before i talk about the dunning kruger effect i should just say real quick is that the the literature on the motivated reasoning stuff is actually really robust. Like you can get okay. those effects, the same effects, no pro. Like it's very uh, easy to get uh, ostensible partisan bias motivated reasoning effects. Uh, the problem is conceptual. That's the lack of theory about what it is about because it comes down to like a a theory of cognitive processes. Um, and what we've been focusing on are things like group differences and ideology and things like that. And so that's it's a it's a it's the, the other uh, crisis that we're having in psychology. One of the other crises is, is the theory crisis, and that this is an example of that. So, the, so it's more of a theoretical issue in that case. Yeah, and you know, uh, definitional trying to understand, trying to get not just examples of an ostensible phenomena, like here's another example of partisan bias in a different sort of way, but what do these things tell us about how how bias emerges and what are the underlying cognitive processes and so on? That's the that's the thing that I think. Um, we need to we need to make more uh, headway on for sure. Yeah. Um, but so yeah. So the Dunning Kruger effect. So the Dunning Kruger effect is the um, the effect that people who are the most incompetent are the least capable of recognizing their incompetency. That is the the same thing that determines you whether you have a competency in some domain is what helps you determine whether you have competency in that domain. And so people who are really bad at something are it affect far more likely to overestimate how good they are at it. And so that you get the same effects for things like humor or uh, performance on reasoning tests. It's actually really robust. Like you, you can easily replicate the Dunning-Kruger effect as well. Uh, we have our own paper, for example. If you, if you take problems where there's an intuitive response that's wrong, like the, you know, if you're running a race and you pass the person in second place, what place are you in? People want to say first place, but you're of course are in second place because you overtake the second place person. Um, if the 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 extent to which people overestimate their performance when they give incorrect intuitive responses is huge like they they're getting people who get zero correct out of eight think that they're getting five correct you know what i mean and then whereas people who think who are getting like uh five correct think they're getting about six correct to six or seven correct and people who are getting six correct think they're getting and then you only ever it only breaks down the overconfidence when you get to the very end but of course if you get all of them correct you can't overestimate right so, so the the um, argument about the Dunning Kruger effect is not necessarily that it doesn't replicate. It's that um, it's a kind of uh, effect of scale, like because you can't overestimate when you're at the top of the scale, then it necessarily is the case that overestimation will be smaller for people at the top of the scale than than at the bottom. Um, I don't I don't really buy the argument that much because people overestimate when they're at midpoint also, and so you could just lop off all of the people who are at ceiling. And you'll still find a huge Dunning Kruger effect in the context of like reasoning tasks, for example. And so I think um, the the basic kind of uh, argument that people who are the most incompetent are at least able to recognize their incompetency is pretty is pretty robust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit now, what are cognitive styles? So a kind of so um, before I was talking about. The, the key kind of key aspect of reflective analytic thinking, the kind of type two, system two, whatever, mm -hmm. is that you gotta you gotta kinda stop and think. And so to some extent that's discretionary, right? Like you if I say thirty eight times seventy two, you have to kind of make a choice. You have to be kind of motivated to solve the problem, right? And uh if that becomes more important when faced with a uh, kind of intuition or some sort of prior belief, you have to be motivated to question whether you might be wrong about something, right? And so that that kind of element of our thinking, that um, being willing to reflect and engage in analytic thinking, that's that's what's referred to as, you know, a, a kind of cognitive style. Uh, Stanovich and Weston uh, people had called it just thinking disposition, which is a bit vague, and so I I started using the term analytic cognitive style to kind of refer to it specifically as just to and and part of the key thing there is that you distinguish 
the willingness to reflect and think analytically from the ability to do so, right? Which is cognitive mm -hmm. ability, right? So you have cognitive style and cognitive ability, two different elements that lead to, to kind of um, improved responses in many contexts. Mm -hmm. And uh, does the cognitive style or the cognitive ability, I, I mean, what are the kinds of outcomes that we get from people that possess that kind of uh, cognition, let's say, because I, I don't want to uh, ask the question, since you differentiated between the two, uh, I'm not sure if it's the cognitive style or the cognitive ability that makes, that leads to some differences in terms of, for example, susceptibility to religious or paranormal beliefs or to beliefs in some pseudo profound bullshit, <laughs> as, as I mentioned in the introduction. So what, how does it go exactly? So, so, um, what we find, so most of my research has been on this, like a lot of it has been on this. Uh, and so there are definitely domains where cognitivity is more important, where like uh, just under having a good understanding of the problem space is going to get you further. But there are other places where it's more important that you just stop and think about it in the first place. And so um, that this is uh, one of the cases where like religious belief, for example, like it's not a particular, I mean, depends on who you ask, there, there can, there's many, you know, um, any uh, of uh, theology that you know say that it's a complex problem, but really, like at base, it's not that pr particularly complicated. You don't need to have particularly high cognitive ability to kind of understand the question of God and so on. What's more important is that you care to think about it, right? And and some of our more recent work, which isn't published yet, looks at uh, not just uh, the uh, the finding that we had in the past, which is that people who are more reflective, analytic, are less religious, but that specifically they're more likely to have changed their belief over time. Um, that you have two kind of main effects, that people who are atheists tend to be more reflective based on our various measures like the Cotter Reflection Test or whatever. They tend to be more reflective than agnostics who are more reflective than people who are apathetic about religion who are more reflective than people who are theists. But you also find that across all those categories, people who had that in the past believe something different tend to be more reflective too. And, so, and that applies even to theists. That is, theists who in the past were apathetic but then became more religious tend to be more reflective than people who are just always religious. And that's because they've bothered to think about it. You know, they've spent time identif th identifying something that they want to think about and actually thinking about it. And that's where it's important what your cognitive style is, whether you're willing and motivated to think about things, right? And you see the same thing with, you know, whether you question you know, uh, BS on the internet or whether you um, stop and think about, you know, is this headline true or false if you see it on social media and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so what are the bases for uh, this style of thinking and analytic cognitive style? Do, do we know if it has any innate bases? I mean, if it has any... I, I don't want to evacuate innate with genetic because that's a complicated, <laughs> a complicated topic to talk about here, but do we know if it has any innate basis or if it is learned or acquired in any way? We don't. I mean, that's, it's a great question, but we don't really. Uh, I, I would love to know more about that. I mean, I assume that it's probably less heritable than just general intelligence is and cognitive ability. Um, it's probably, it's not as variable perhaps as just like the extent of domain knowledge, which depends on what you happen to learn in your life and you know, who you've been, been around and so on. Um, but uh, what I, I get to think about it in the context of like, it's kind of like a stance towards thinking, right? Uh, and that, that to me seems like something that can be taught and nurtured you know what I mean? Like, do you do you rely on faith, or do you tend to like to value reflection and so on? Um, I don't know that that's true, though. Like, I don't have evidence for that. I mean, it just seems true to me, but I don't. I'm not sure. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've I've for a long time wanted to research this, but it's you know it's a lot harder than <laughs> what I'm presently researching, and so I I, I haven't got around to it. So the specific phenomenon probably also hasn't been included in twin studies in behavioral genetics, right? No, they, you know, no, like that. Yeah, uh, we haven't we haven't broken that barrier. Yet. The the um, mass awareness of this kind of distinction, which I think is important, um, hasn't. Uh, 
you know, and so far as people look at stuff like that, they just look at general cognitive ability, which makes sense. You know, it's it's a it's a pretty they're also like correlated, obviously, and so some of the things that are true for cognitive ability are going to be true for cognitive style. But of course, what that means is some of the differences that we have that relate to like things like IQ or just general cognitive ability tests could be because of differences in cognitive style. We don't know that either, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a vast literature that needs to be re reevaluated essentially. Um, and you know, I look forward to that happening hopefully sometime in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's see where we get in the future then. Okay. So and about specifically pseudo profound bullshit. So in your work, you talk about the discourse that usually goes associated with it. What are uh, how is it characterized? So the, this kind of discourse, for this pseudo profound discourse, what characterizes it? Right, so we the, we um, came up with this the moniker pseudo profound to kind of uh, detail a specific form of bullshit, which is like using using complicated words to mask an underlying lack of content, basically to use like abstract buzzwords or to um, uh, obfuscate or to like um, uh, what, it's what you what you often find in like new age uh, circles where, well, I mean, but also sometimes in like pseudo kind of scientific writing where people use like fake scientific or like scientific sounding words or like in the natural food industry where you where you see like uh, um, people use not in that case it's more simple words but like you know instead of saying water you say like. <laughs> like natural spring water or whatever. Um, and so, so yeah, like, per, I'll give per, perhaps another good phrase would be quantum leap. That uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, or are we using just the word quantum and that kind of Deepak Chopra esque discourse, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So, like one of the so in the paper we we used to create our pseudo profound bullshit sentences were two word generators. One was called the New Age Bullshit Generator, and it uses things like uh, lots of qu quantum, it says quantum soup a lot and consciousness and things of that nature. And so it just creates sentences that are very abstract. Um, I could pull one up here if I, if you want me to. Um, and then, and then the other one takes buzzwords from Deepak Chopra's Twitter feed. Deepak Chopra being a, a new age guru, someone who uses also, he has a, I think he has a book called quantum consciousness actually. Uh, and you know, quantum healing and like he uses quantum a lot, not in ways that physicists use it. Uh, um, well, I think and there's, so, a, and, uh, there's also a Deepak Chopra uh, f uh, sentence generator in the on the internet or something yeah, like that. That's what we, that's what we use. That's what we use. We use the generator to create our materials. It's called wisdomofchopra.com. And so I'll give an example of a sentence we got from that uh, one that I can remember. It's hidden meaning transforms unparalleled abstract beauty. All right. So that's that's a that's a random sentence used, using buzzwords from Deepak Chopra's Twitter feed. And that you know. And so the the task that we give people is just simply we ask them if they think it's profound, right? Um, and uh, if you give people sentences that are not super profound, but they're actually just like motivational sentences, you know, uh, um, I can't think of one now, but um, that's something you'd see on a motivational poster, then they, you know, those people, you know, if you ask about the profundity ratings for those things, that does not correlate as strongly with things like whether you're reflective or whether you believe in alternative medicines as whether people, the extent to which people rate those random bullshit sentences as profound. And so it's something, some sort of kind of specific, like um, being so open-minded that, that your brain falls out type of thing. Uh, we call it reflexive open-mindedness where you just kind of agree with everything that you see and you just find profundity. And it's not, it's not like a necessarily a bad thing in this case, right? It's not, it's not that, it's wrong for them to think that these sentences were found. It just indicates that they're likely to be receptive to bullshit, right? Uh, because they they see these things and they they don't really know what they mean, but they still they still think they're cool, right? Mm -hmm. And in that context, let's talk a little bit about the language used by climate change deniers. Perhaps this is a more serious topic, or at least with more serious with consequences that are more serious for us and for the planet. So, what characterizes the language used by them? Right. So, I, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Sir Dan Manimort, when we were in uh, grad school together, he's a language expert. 
like he knows knows how to do language analysis. And I was, you know, interested in topics related to science. We did this paper on language use for climate change deniers and uh, scientists. And so what we did is we took there's this the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change physical report of this huge scientific document written by like hundreds of scientists to review the actual physical evidence for climate change. This was 2013. Uh, that was the one that we used. And that has like, I think it's 600,000 words or something like that. Um, so we took the entire corpus and we did like uh, word level uh, and some other types of analyses on what the language is like. And then we took uh, a document that was created by what's called the Non-Governmental uh, International Panel on Climate Change, which is uh, this group funded by the Heartland Institute, which is a conservative think tank, and it was written by, you know, like a, a dozen, dozen-ish dozen people who are climate change, like skeptics, deniers, whatever you want to call them, okay? And so if you look at the documents side by side, they're very similar, right? They they made this NIPCC to be a complement to the IPCC, and, that, and they actually sent it to educators, and like, it's pretty official looking. It's got graphs and figures, and it's got uh, science in it and like they are reviewing papers and all that kind of stuff uh, but of course uh, underneath all that is our big differences right one document is a kind of scientific document from established experts and the other one's a policy document basically like they they, they are an advocacy document rather not policy advocacy they're they're like um, using it to to further a political end uh, like explicitly and so we did the language analysis, and what we find is that basically every indicator that you look at that is something that you'd expect to be, you know, greater or smaller given scientific language is is stronger for the IPCC, the actual scientists, than it is for the climate change deniers. So, for example, you see far more tentative language in the climate change uh, uh, scientist document than the de denier document. You see more emotional words in the... Uh, in the denier document than the scientific document. The, re the reading level is lower. It's basically like the difference between like three grade point. It's like looking at a grade 12 textbook and comparing it to like a grade mm -hmm. seven or nine textbook. Um, and so that it's actually the differences are pretty remarkable because one document that is the one from the scientist is saying, we need to be careful you know, the world is, uh, the climate uh, is uh, getting warmer and there, we're going to be facing big problems. And they're still using more tentative language than the document that's saying everything's fine, we're cool, let's chill, right? Um, not literally, obviously. And so the um, and so that's the you see that, but that's because one document's written by scientists as a scientific document, and the other one's an advocacy document. And that's so that's the that's what we found in terms of the, uh, the language used for climate change deniers. <laughs> okay, for the last topic of this interview, let's then talk about finally fake news and misinformation. So, what uh, is fake news exactly? How do you operationalize it, and what are you what are you talking about when you mention fake news in your in your work and other people as well as your collaborators? Right. So, uh, fake news is this. It's, it's, so it's not new in the sense that um, falsehoods, misinformation, these are, these are as old as information basically is. Um, but in 2016, during the U.S. presidential election and the Brexit, Brexit election, this new thing came up where people were creating fake websites that look like news websites and then just making up headlines. And so, so they're pretty similar to tabloids, uh, but the difference is that like tabloids are branded. They're in a specific place in the supermarket or whatever. Um, the, what's different here is that people are making things up and then they're going and spreading on Facebook as if they aren't, as if they're legitimate news headlines. And then people started spreading them and there's no, there was no um, mechanisms in place to curtail their spread. And so millions of people saw false headlines leading up to the election. Uh, and it hasn't, I mean, the social media companies have done more to to stop the you know spread of fabricated news headlines since then, but you, we've seen lots and lots since the start of the COVID pandemic as well. So um, there's still a persistent problem there. Mm -hmm. So th this is something that already existed and probably existed since uh, y uh, since the very beginning of our species, but nowadays it goes to a whole new level because of the internet, for example. Yeah, the 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 
the category of thing that is like misinformation, falsehoods, made up stuff, that's not new at all, obviously. What's different is the way in which people are interacting with it, right? And the context in which they're viewing it. And, and so that has different consequences. Like as an example, you know, um, people are probably going to be in a different sort of mindset when they see a claim on the front of National Enquirer, which they know is a tabloid website, than if they're on Facebook and someone that they know shares and they may trust shares a headline that says the Pope endorsed Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton has people buried in her backyard or whatever, right? They, they, that is their, the extent to which they are likely to be in that deliberative sort of mindset that I was talking about before might, might be different. And so that's why it, it's something that needs to be investigated as a specific sort of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And do fake news really have a big impact on people's lives or do they change, for example, their political positions, their political orientation, or is it that people that already have a certain kind of political orientation are more predisposed to believe certain fake news and to cluster in different, let's say, as people call them, echo chambers? I mean, what I'm trying to ask is, where does the arrow of causality point to? Right. I guess, I mean, to, to kind of... One thing about the question is that it depends on your baseline, right? Uh, the extent to which it influences people, it's not so much that reading one fake news headline is going to change someone's life or make them change their ideology or change their opinion about the leader or whatever. In many cases, they'll probably just ignore it. It might have... It, we do show that, like, a single prior exposure headline makes it more likely to be believed later on, but that doesn't mean that it's carrying over to people's attitudes. So it's unlikely that fake news, per se, is having a huge influence on many people's lives. It probably is having a, an influence, maybe even a large influence, on some people's lives, people who whose echo chamber is... Uh, being um, overrun by fake news uh, and narratives that are supported by fake news headlines and and not just fake news headlines but also like hyperpartisan media uh, content like Breitbart for example which have a much larger following than do fake news headlines um, and so some people could be hugely affected some people won't be affected at all so I mean some people don't even have Facebook and so they're not gonna it's not gonna unless someone tells them something that they hear on Facebook or whatever um, and so, so I guess it kind of depends. Like it probably, my, my guess is that um, the initial hand-wringing about the phenomena might have been a bit overblown. Like whether or not it had an impact on the election, for example, is hard to say. Um, it doesn't, but it's still something that impacts some people's lives. And in any case, anything that is giving people you know, opportunities to form false beliefs is something that I think is important and that needs to be curtailed. So that's that's basically enough for me to be motivated to investigate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, would you say, or is it possible to say if fake news is basically a symptom of a polarized political uh, society, like for example in the US, or if fake news instead of a symptom can be a cause of polarization? I mean, probably your answer will be the same, but anyway. Yeah, I think it's both. I mean, um, I mean, we, you do see lots of fake news and <clears throat> similar headlines elsewhere in the world, but they do tend to be tied to, of course, like people who are making these things up, some of them are just doing it for financial gain. They're, they're trying to get advertising money by getting things spread on Facebook so that people click on it on their website. Um, so they'll make up things that people will draw people's attention. And so therefore it follows, you know, what the narratives are and so on. But then, you know, insofar as people read them, then that's going to maybe have impacts on where the narrative is going and so on. Um, so I think, I think it's obviously both. I mean, in some cases, like for example, in India, some of the fake news headlines were, um, were like attacking certain groups and then leading to, you know, uh, violence and stuff like that. And so it, um, it's a, it it uh, would not occur within a vacuum where there aren't already issues, um, but it certainly, I think, can play a role in exacerbating those issues, no question. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the, in terms of false information, and because probably uh, not all false information is spread among people the same way, there are probably some fake news that are more successful than others. Do we know anything about what characterizes the types of false information that spread the most among people? I mean, does it have something to do with the linguistic style, with the 
type of content do we know something about it? That's it's a, it's a good question. It's hard to say because the headlines that I use in in the studies are ones that have been like fact checked and verified as false. And to get there, they need to reach a certain kind of level of engagement, yeah. so that someone will bother to fact check it. Right? That it has to get so like so we're already okay, taking the top kind of part of the slice of all the falsehood on the internet and that's what we're looking in our studies but within that we've done some studies looking at like what will predict whether people share a headline you know and and unsurprisingly you know the things that are more partisan and in line with people's ideology uh, predict whether it's shared things that are more important you know it's not like the ideology effect isn't maybe as big as people like might think it is but you know things that seem important people will share um, uh, and uh, things that are, of course, are like emotionally evocative, right? That produce fear, outrage, or uh, usually it's negative emotions. If you look, if you look through the fake news, most of them are negative. Um, tend maybe because those things are more evocative, uh, just generally. And so that's that's what generally kind of it has to capture people's attention, basically, uh, and give them some sort of reason to 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 uh, share it. And so that if you have something that's triggers some sort of emotional response, and then that is also in line with their political inclinations, then you have a couple things that are lining up to, to lead someone to, to share it. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there people that are more su susceptible to fake news than others? And what would be the cognitive traits that render people more success uh, susceptible to fake news in that case? Right. It's a, so th this is a realm where it's the same as what I said before. That is because the content is kind of developed specifically to grab people's attention and to like get them to share it and therefore has like this emotional resonance or whatever to be effective at not doing so and not believing it you got to stop and think about it right and that's that's a key element people who are more reflective tend to share less uh false content uh and that's we have that also not just like in our studies but we have twitter data where we you know we had people do uh, some tests of cognitive reflection and then they gave us their Twitter handles and then we looked and saw that you know people who are more reflective actually have more reasonable Twitter feeds <laughs> like they're not sharing they're sharing higher quality content and so on um, and so that's that that key element of like stopping and thinking and reflecting on things that's that's important but also like we talked about pseudo profound bullshit before that also correlates with whether you share false headlines and whether you can distinguish between true and false headlines because not just do you stop and think about things, but are you um, automatically uh, prone to believing things? Uh, you know, uh, that's that's another element. You know, those are kind of related, but they're they're slightly distinct. And so things of that nature. That and also in the states, at least, uh, and a few other countries actually, um, uh, Italy and France, I think, you find that people who are politically conservative tend to share more uh, false content. Part of that also is because there is more, for whatever reason. Um, more pro-conservative fake news out there than there is pro-liberal. Mm -hmm. In in Canada during the election, we did a study, and I was tracking like political um, Facebook uh, pages, and I, I had a very hard time finding like pro-liberal fake news. It, almost all of it was pro-conservative stuff or anti-liberal, obviously. Um, and so there's something there's something there, and I don't know if it's um, supply demand or what but uh, that seems to be that seems to be one element that's important uh, I'm not sure if this is correct what I'm about to say and if it would have some sort of important influence on the on spreading fake news among for example in this case conservative uh, political people but uh, isn't it the case that there's a correlation between IQ and being more liberal or more conservative, isn't it the case that there's a correlation, for example, between higher IQ and people that tend to be more on the liberal side of the aisle, or not? Um, there, there, uh, there, there's some evidence that there is, although it would be pretty small. I mean, the the different the IQ differences are smaller than the fake news sharing differences, um, and they, in our studies they don't they don't that, that is, we don't have iq in our studies we have cognitive reflection um but uh, that doesn't explain the difference uh so that i mean that's a reasonable hypothesis that we 
thought also would be <laughs> the explanation, but it's not. Um, mm. There's something else, and I, so that tells me that, it, like we did, we did a different study, one uh, that has some bearing on this, where um, we we noticed that the pro Republican headlines tend to focus more on people's character, like they would be like character assassination, like they would say something bad about how Clinton, like how Hillary Clinton's a bad person or whatever, something that would imply that. Whereas the Democratic ones tend to be false, but they're more related to like making bad decisions or something like that. Um, and so we didn't know if that was because, for whatever reason, people who are making the pro-Republican ones had different, you know, who knows what what would cause that. So we wanted to see if there was a genuine difference between Democrats and Republicans and how they interpret these character or whatever. And so we, when we gave them actual headlines from the world, which we pre-tested to be like very balanced, you find that Republicans are more... They like the ones that are more character focused than than Democrats do. But then what we did is we took headlines, we created our own ones that are perfectly matched, like exactly the same headlines, character focused, not character focused, whatever. And there were no differences between Democrats, and Republicans. Um, and so the the moral of the story is that it's very hard to know what's causing differences when you're showing people content that's different, right? Like the pro democratic content and the pro-Republican content that we give people in our studies or that is being shared literally by people on social media, those are different headlines, right? And so it might be the headlines that are causing the differences, not the differences between Democrats and Republicans. And we just, it's hard to distinguish those things. Mm -hmm. And does it make any difference when people are exposed to repeated statements? Because this is something that even outside of the realm of fake news, politicians, for example, do a lot. They, particularly during political campaigns, they repeat and repeat and repeat the same kind of slogans and the same kinds of accusations against their opponents and things like that. So the, do repeated statements have an important effect on people or, or not? They do. I mean, the, so that actually the first ever experiment on the effect of repetition on judgments of truth was from 1977, Lynn Hasher and colleagues. Uh, what we did is we did the same experiment or like whatever, a similar experiment, but we looked at specifically fake news. And we found a single prior exposure to a fake news headline increases later belief in that headline. It doesn't matter if people remembered having seen it before. It doesn't matter even if it's politically consistent or inconsistent, right? If you show people who are Clinton, this was run at the time of the inauguration, if you show people who are Clinton supporters a headline that is like completely like anti-Clinton, like she's got bodies buried in her backyard or whatever, and then you like you show them one time and then later on you ask them, do, do they believe it? They believe it to be, they don't like, most people don't still believe it, but they judge it as more plausible basically given that one repetition. Mm -hmm. Even though it's against their ideology, and so it's a very robust effect, and it's 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 evident even for people who are high in cognitive ability. In fact, it's equally evident for people that are high in cognitive ability. And so that what it indicates is that we really do use familiarity as a pretty strong heuristic to judge truth, and probably because you know things that we saw before are easier to process, and that is just a, a, a an aspect of our intuition that is hard to hard to override. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's really a familiarity effect. It's not a popularity effect, because I would imagine that in some cases, the reason why people get exposed to repeated information would be because the, it reaches more and more people with time. Yeah, that's right. I mean, in this case, we 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 totally separate that possibility because we have, uh, in the experiment, we're just all the everything's counterbalanced so that people there's some headlines that are repeated some are not repeated but for other people the ones that are not repeated are the ones that are repeated and so on and the the effect is is there for everything um it's pretty remarkable even headlines that people only believe like they're super implausible like one was that trump was going to for some reason ban all gay tv i don't know why he would do that but that was one of the headlines um it was only believed by five percent of the people at baseline with one repetition, it was believed by 10% of the people, right? <laughs> so, like, uh, yeah, it's, it, it doubles the amount of people that believe it. It's still only 10% of people that believe it, but, like, it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me just ask you one last question. Are there any scientifically proven methods to effectively fight against the spread of fake news and misinformation on the Internet, on social media, or whatever mediums? It's a great question. It depends on what you mean by fight. Like, fact-checking definitely works in the sense that if you tell people 
this is some people there's reason to believe this is wrong they generally do respond to that positively you know what i mean like not not always the case and blah blah, blah but generally speaking there's over, an overall kind of positive effect of that of course there are uh, outside of the scientific like evidence for the uh power of like fact checking and warnings there's pragmatic problems with that which is like it's impossible to keep up as fact checkers with all the falsehood um and so that's not it's not a particularly pragmatic solution it's only kind of aspect of a solution um there's other things that seem to to work if you give people like uh digital literacy tips this recent paper by andrew guess and uh, colleagues that says that will help them identify false news better which is good you know um if you there's a kind of inoculation approach where you look at give people like a game uh, Sandra Vanderlyn and, and uh, John Rosenbeek have this, it's called the bad news game where you go through and then they give you tips on how to identify fake news through like a game so it's more engaging but of course the problem with that is that people have to sign up and go through the game to do it and pe the people who need the intervention the most are the least likely to probably do that um, and so again all these things are uh, there's lots of things that you can do but many of them aren't exactly scalable or things that can be used on social media um, what we've been doing that is me and my colleague Dave Rand uh, at MIT and, and other colleagues of ours, um, is this different sort of approach that we think is more scalable. And it leverages what I talked about before, which is that on social media, people might not be in the kind of mode of thinking where they're stopping and reflecting about things in a sort of analytic way. They don't stop and think about whether things are accurate before they share them. They they In one study, what we did is we asked people in one condition do you think this is accurate or not? And and we gave them a bunch of like headlines. And in this case, it was headlines related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so they were pretty good at identifying the true versus false headlines. They only believed the, the false ones, like I can't, what the actual number is, but like 25% of the time. But then if you asked a different group of people, would you share this on social media? They shared the false headlines 35% of the time. That is, people were sharing 10% more of the headlines that they probably could have identified as being false. People were sharing things that they probably would realize were false if they stopped and thought about it. Because, you know, when you're on social media, whether something's true or false is not the primary thing that people tend to think about. They think about whether it's going to get likes or all that kind of stuff. And so our intervention is just tr triggering people, nudging people to think about accuracy. And so we, we, in one experiment, we give people at the start of experiment, ostensibly as kind of part of a pretest, uh, a single kind of fake news headline. Uh, and we say, do you think this is accurate? And then and they're like, okay, well, whatever. It doesn't matter what the hell they respond. We just want them to think about accuracy. And then after that, we give them the actual task, which is like whether they, which headlines they would share on social media. And if you ask about accuracy versus if you ask about nothing or if you ask about whether they think it's funny or whatever, what you find is asking about accuracy, you know, leads to people to make better choices in what they share. They discern more between what's true and false in their later judgments. And then we did a, a Twitter experiment doing the same thing where we threw, and there's lots of greedy details there, but we created a bunch of bots and they followed people and the people followed us back. We could send them direct messages. We sent these people a message saying, hey, do you think this headline's accurate? Which is like a super weird thing to get from a bot, but most people ignored it. But we still did, we didn't care. We just want them to read the, the message, get them to think about accuracy. And what we found is that for the 24 hours that followed, people shared more better like news content, basically. And so... Triggering people to think about accuracy is just like simple thing that we could do to help them make better choices on social media. And it's something that's scalable that you could just, there's lots of different ways that you can get people to remind people about accuracy, ad campaigns, asking them questions as prompts, you know, whatever that social media companies could do. And it doesn't require anything. It doesn't require fact checkers. It doesn't require people to sign up for something. It doesn't require, you know, uh, and anything apart from people's like kind of capacity generally to actually recognize things that are false, which people are better at than we think. And uh, at least they could be better if they were, you know, willing to stop and think about things a little bit more, which is what the point of the intervention is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's good news. So, Dr. Pennycook, let's end the interview here. Just before we go, would you like to r refer to any places on the internet, websites or, so or social media where people can find you and your work? Um, I am uh, identifiable on Twitter at Gord Pennycook. Uh, I have a website which is also found on Twitter. I think it's just GordonPennycook.net or something. I don't know. Google, but that's it. And uh, 
you can go to my research gate page, I guess, but I don't update it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know what's going on in that page. So, uh, yeah, Twitter's probably the better place, especially if you want to hear more of my dumb opinions. <laughs> okay, so I uh, will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Pennycook, thank you a lot again for taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to everyone. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klimpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.